peace, infinite waters diving deep once again, we have a very special guest joining us today. That's an understatement. We have Dr. Bruce Lipton. He is an internationally recognized authority in bridging science and spirit and a leading voice in new biology. A cell biologist by training, he taught cell biology at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and later performed pioneering studies at Stanford University's School of Medicine. He has been a guest speaker on dozens of TV and radio shows, as well as a keynote presenter for national conferences. Thank you so much, Bruce, for diving with us today. Ralph, I am so honored to be on your program, and I just want to acknowledge my appreciation for what you're doing. You're providing the world with new insights and new knowledge that's necessary to take us from this very chaotic state into a much better world. And so thank you for your work. Well, thank you. And this interview, I want it to be based around the science of healing and how we can heal our bodies. I love your work, The Biology of Belief, Spontaneous Evolution, and your latest book, The Honeymoon Effect. A lot of us, we feel helpless when we have a disease, but your books are full of inspiration. The question I have for you is, do your genes control your health? <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely not. And this is a, the biggest issue we have to face because we've been programmed with a, a misperception about how life works. And I started to realize this when I was teaching medical students the nature of what we call genetic determinism. Genetic determinism is a belief that the genes control the character of your biology and your physiology and your behavior. And when you teach that, what we're really teaching is really uh, um, a very negative thing because as far as we know, we didn't pick the genes we came with. You don't like the genes you got, you can't do anything about it. Right. And then teach that these genes control your life. And what we're really teaching is you're a victim of your heredity. You got cancer running in your family or Alzheimer's or diabetes or something like that. And then the presumption is, oh, my God, I, I have these genes that cause these problems. And it turns out this is totally false. Genes do not cause things. Genes are just blueprints to make parts to the body. And so it becomes very important to understand is like if you want to build a, a house, you can go to a building supply place. And so you go into the plumbing department, and they've got all these different parts and things like that. And by selecting the parts and then putting them together in a certain way, you can create whatever you want. The biology is similar in this regard that the building parts are called the proteins. You use the proteins, there are 100,000 different versions of proteins, so as you assemble them in different ways, you create different biology. Now the issue is, what is a gene? Well, the gene is a blueprint to make the protein parts. Why this is important to recognize that it is a blueprint is simple. Uh, Ralph, we go into an architect's office and she's working on a blueprint and you lean over her shoulder and you ask her a simple question, is your blueprint on or off? And, and she would look at you like, well, what are you talking about? There's a blueprint, it's not on and off. And I want to say this is the most profound point. Genes are blueprints. There's no on and off to a gene. They don't control their own behavior. They don't cause things. You have to have a contractor. You have to have someone who say, I want these blueprints to build this thing. And when you understand that, then all of a sudden you realize the genes don't control anything. They don't even, a gene doesn't make a decision to be on or off. A gene is just a blueprint. Well, for all the years, what have we done? We've given the genes the power that they decide what happens to us when it turns out, no, we're the ones that create the genetic activity. My research from 47 years ago, I was cloning stem cells while I was teaching this genetic determinism to medical students. My research revealed that the environment was controlling genetic activity. And this led to a, a new science that is called epigenetics. Now, it sounds like, oh, genetics, epigenetics, sounds like the same thing. I go, no, it's a revolution for this reason. When I say genetic control, I am saying control by genes. That's the belief most people have.
But this new science is called epigenetic control. And why is that important? Because epi, that little prefix epi, means above. So when I say epigenetic control, I am literally saying control above the genes. Well, this is the new science. And it turns out that between the genes and the world in which we live is the nervous system. The nervous system reads the world and then adjusts the biology to survive in that world. So the nervous system is what reads the environment and sends messages to the genes. Well, the significance about that is then the way we see the world, our perception of the world, is really what controls our genetic activity. If I program you with a belief that you're powerless, that's your perception, then that belief is translated by the mind into chemistry, and the chemistry goes into the blood, and that chemistry then goes to the cells that make up our body and control gene activity. The relevance is very important. Epigenetics says, look, we can change our perception of the environment. We can change the environment. Therefore, we're not victims of the genes. We're the masters because we're the ones that are ultimately controlling the environment in which our genes are responding. Why this is relevant, just give you a simple understanding. I put cells in a plastic Petri dish. I put the dish uh, in a good environment. The cells grow beautifully. If I take the dish from a good environment and put it in a bad environment, the cells start to get sick and die. If there was a doctor that would come and look at my cells, he'd say, Bruce, your, your cells are sick. We should give them some drugs. And I go, absolutely not. You want your cells to be well? Take the dish from the bad environment, move it back into the good environment, and they will instantaneously get well again. Well, the, report, or the importance of this understanding is profound because it says, our health is a reflection of how we read the environment, how we interpret that environment. Why the interpretation is an important part because it says, look, I could live in the most wonderful supporting environment that exists, but if I believe I'm a victim or I believe that people are against me or the world's against me, my cells don't see the real good world out there. My cells see what my mind is telling them. So all of a sudden, I'm adjusting my cells by my belief, <laughs> and right. they don't see the real world. And so here's a very important simple fact. Only about 1% of illness is directly connected to genes. The point, 99% of illness is really connected to how we live in the world, how we perceive the world, our lifestyle, what we do and what we believe, because our mind is converting our beliefs into chemistry, and that chemistry goes into the blood, and that, through epigenetics, controls our biology. So rather than victims... When we understand the new knowledge, we become masters of our lives. We're the ones that can change the environment. We can change our beliefs. And when we do, we change the world. And, and, and the concept that mind controls biology is, is not a new thing at all. Matter of fact, almost everybody in the audience already knows something called the placebo effect. The placebo effect, which is actually responsible for most medical healing, is not due to the drugs or the therapy offered by the medical doctor. The placebo effect results from your belief in the drugs or the therapy. So that's why I can tell you, here's this pill that's going to heal you, and it's brand new, and it's all magical, and blah, 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 and you take the pill, and you get healed, and then later I tell you it was a sugar pill. Well, what's the relevance? The answer was, the sugar pill didn't heal you. Your belief healed you. Right. Well, most people will say, yeah, okay, I know about that belief, that positive belief, the placebo effect. What I want to emphasize right now, Ralph, is something more important. It's not just positive belief that influences our lives. Negative beliefs are equally powerful in controlling our biology. And so uh, there's a field of science called the nocebo effect versus placebo. Nocebo is the result of negative thinking. And what it turns out is negative thinking, positive thinking are equally powerful that they both influence our health. In fact, negative thinking, fear, can kill you. It kills you yes. because of the belief that kills you, the chemistry that comes from negative thinking. So people don't recognize, so we always talk about the placebo effect, and I go, that's great. Do you understand the nocebo effect? Negative thinking can cause cancer. Negative thinking can cause any disease. It can kill you. 
And that becomes important because we're the ones that have the thoughts. And if we come from negative thinking, which is psychologists tell us that almost all of our thinking is negative, um, and that's part of programming, that if we come from a world of negative thinking, then we will manifest a chemistry in our body that does not support our health and, in fact, can actually kill you. And, uh, and this is why it's important because people disregard the thinking and going, oh, no, my biology is controlled by my genes and my chemistry. And I go, <laughs> no, it's controlled first by your thinking. And this is important because um, we have to uh, really understand the nature that our thoughts are coming from our mind, okay? But then I have to explain this problem because people think, well, I had positive thoughts. <laughs> it didn't seem to work for me. I was thinking positive. And I go, okay, let's get a fact clear that's so important, Ralph. It's the most important thing I can tell you. Our mind is controlling our biology. Yes, one. Two, we have two parts to the mind. We have a conscious mind and a subconscious mind. We have in the past made a mistake and just said, oh, that's one mind, you know, they're both in the same one mind. I go, no, 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 they're two separate minds. They have different ways of functioning and different ways of learning. And when you don't understand that, then the world seems crazy. So it goes like this. The conscious mind is connected to your spirituality, your source, your identity. That makes you different than every other person. So... Every person's conscious mind, which is the latest evolution of the brain, right behind your forehead. This is the seed of our personal identity. The conscious mind is the creative mind. It's very important because the subconscious mind is more reactive, reflexive, stimulus response. Push the button, get the response. Push the button, get the response. It's, it's habits, okay? The creative mind separated us from lower animals. Lower animals can only make certain responses, stimulus response, stimulus response. Humans with creativity can make a difference between the stimulus and before the response. I can create stuff and I can change the outcome. So the conscious mind is very creative. And I ask you a question, Ralph, very important question. I said, tell me what you want from your life. You want, you know, what is it you really want? When you give me answers such as, oh, I want to be healthy, uh, I want to have a great relationship, I want to have a great job, I want to be a good golfer, whatever that means, uh, uh, the whole idea about that is what? These are creative thoughts because they don't exist. And I'm looking forward into the future. What do I want? I'm looking for my creativity, okay? So as I'm looking, as I'm being creative, the process of my creative character is coming from my conscious mind. So here's the point. The conscious mind has your wishes and your desires in it. I say, what do you want? Whatever answer you come up with, I can tell you right now it's creative, and it comes from the conscious mind. Okay, so conscious mind is creative. Okay? The subconscious mind is the habit mind. Not very much creativity. It's push the buttons, play the behavior. It's habits. You, you, you repeat them over and over and over and over and over again. Okay? Problem. <laughs> Before you can be conscious, you have to have programs so you can be conscious of something. I, I'll give you a simple example. I say, look, a baby is just being born, and, and pretend that the baby could speak. Just pretend. I say, okay, the baby's just being born. It's coming out of the birth canal, and I say, tell me something. And the baby will look up at you and go, I don't know anything. I just got here. The whole idea is this. Before you can become conscious, you have to have programs to be conscious of. I'll give you one more example. We go to the uh, Apple store, we buy a new iPod. Take it out of the box. The little wheel on the front of the iPod, they call it the click wheel. It's like the conscious mind. Why? It's creative. Make a playlist, select what you want, push play, stop, whatever you want to do. Creative. So I say, okay, brand new iPod, out of the box, and I say, push play. And you push play, and nothing happens. Right. And people look at you and they say, well, what would they say, Ralph? How come nothing played? Okay, I'm going to tell you the answer. <laughs> <I got you. laughs> you can't play anything if you don't have any programs. Yes. You've got to download the program first, then you can make a playlist. Okay? The human mind is the same thing. Before I can be conscious, I have to have behaviors and programs. I have no idea about anything until I understand the world. So... The first seven years of our lives, 
the mind is in download. It's in a state called theta, EEG, electroencephalograph, brain function. Theta is imagination. That's what kids have between two and seven. Mix the real world and the imaginary world. You know, you tell the kid, hey, give me the broom, and the kid's riding. It's a, that's not a broom, it's a horse. To the kid, it's a horse at that moment, <laughs> no matter if you see it as a broom. Imagination. Most importantly is this. Theta is hypnosis. And why is that relevant? The first seven years of your life, your brain is downloading behavior so you can become a functional member. So you can be a functional member of yes. society and a family. you got to know the rules. That's well, that's what I love about your work because you talk of the first seven years and I always share that with my audience. And the big question many of us have is how do we start reprogramming the subconscious mind? Ah. Well, okay, so let's, let's add two little facts and then we'll go into the reprogramming part, okay? Okay. Number one, the conscious mind, which is really great and it's creative, also has the ability to think. And that creates a problem for the following reason. I say, um, hey, Ralph, what are you doing next Friday? The moment I ask you that question, you stop paying attention to the current moment. You go in your head and you go like through a, a calendar and well, what am I doing on Friday? You're thinking about it, right? Well, what's the point? The moment you're thinking, your consciousness is not paying attention to what's going on. It's thinking. It's inside. Okay, so what's the problem? 95%. Listen, listen 95% of our waking hours, the conscious mind is thinking. Why is that relevant? Well, simple. 95% of the time, it's not paying attention to what's going on. It doesn't mean you stop. Well, if you're walking down the street and then you have a thought, you don't stop and then have a thought and then go back to walking again. You continue walking or you're driving the car. You can have a thought while you're driving the car, but you're still driving the car, but your mind's not paying attention. So I say, who's running the show when your conscious mind is thinking 95% of the time? And the answer is the default program is whatever you start thinking, you switch into the behavior in the subconscious mind. That allows you to keep walking or keep driving while you're not paying attention. Subconscious mind is a million times more powerful a computer than the conscious mind. So it's very powerful. You drive the car without you thinking about it. Matter of fact, most of the time, you don't even think about the driving. It's all automatic anyway. Yes. Well, why is this relevant? Here's the simple fact. The conscious mind has your wishes and desires and what you want from your life. When you operate from that mind, you manifest wishes and desires and what you want from your life. But then we recognize a simple fact. Only 5% of the time are you operating from that mind because it's in thought 95% of the time. Why is that relevant? And I say, well, then who's running your life? The answer is, not your conscious mind with wishes and desires. Your subconscious mind with programs is running your life. Right, right. And the childhood experiences we have are the exactly. biggest factor. <laughs> and then I say, well, tell me about the character quality of those programs. And I can tell you right now, psychologists will tell you 70% or more of those programs are negative, disempowering, self-sabotaging, and limiting. Meaning... When you're on subconscious programming, 70% or more of your behavior is not supporting you. It's actually sabotaging you. Right. And then you say, yeah, but, but I would see that if I was sabotaging myself. And I go, that, that's the problem. Why? Why are you playing the subconscious program? Because the conscious mind's not paying attention. Point. That means that when I am playing the subconscious program, I'm the one that's not even seeing what the program is. So when I give my lecture and I ask the audience, I say, listen, go back to a time in your life where uh, you must have had a friend you were very close to. You knew your friend's behavior very, very well. Yeah, a close friend. I say, but you also knew your friend's parent. And one day you see your friend has the exact same behavior as their parent. So, you know, you, you feel all excited. You volunteer. You go, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. Back away from Bill. Bill will go totally ballistic and say, how can you compare me to my dad? And everyone laughs because they're all familiar with it. And I go, this is the most profound story I can tell you for a very simple reason. Everyone else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. 
the only one who doesn't see it is Bill. How does that work? The answer is simple. He downloaded the behavior from his dad in the first seven years, and he plays that behavior when he's not paying attention. So when he's doing his dad's behavior, he's the one that doesn't see it. And then I go, big next point. We are all Bill. Every one of us is doing it <laughs> every day. And this becomes really important because our conscious mind with wishes and desires that wants to take us to a happy, successful, healthy world only is controlling it 5% of the time. 95% is coming from other people, and, and most of that, 70% or more, negative. So when on a day-by-day -day basis, you're not running your life, your subconscious programs are running your life. And these came from other people. They didn't answer your wishes and desires. As a matter of fact, they limited your ability. They disempowered you. It's not a brand new thing. <laughs> really irritates me. <laughs> the Jesuits would say, give me a child until it's six or seven. It will belong to the church for the rest of its life. Mm. What, did they, what did they know? They know if I can get your pro programming for the first seven years, I don't care what you want to be in your life. You're still going to come back and be a member of that church. What was the point? The program in the first seven years will ultimately control your life irregardless of your personal wishes and desires. They already knew if I get your programming, I own your life. Well, this programming has been the thing that has kept us from experiencing the true life on this planet. And the movie, The Matrix, as I mentioned, Matrix is, is not a scientific fiction, it's science fiction. It's a documentary. Yes. We all got programmed. We were all programmed. We and, are. And, yeah. And the movie, they say, well, take the blue pill, stay in the program. Life is exactly the same way. Yeah, life. Yeah, once you run the program, that is your life. They say, but take the red pill and get out of the program. And I go, wow, what would happen if you took the red pill? And now I can give you the answer. Science has found out when we fall in love, we don't default to the subconscious. We keep our conscious mind present. That's called being mindful. Well, why is that relevant? Well, if you keep your conscious mind present, then all your behavior is controlled by wishes and desires. And why is that relevant? Because if two people come together, fall in love, keep their both conscious minds present, then what are they creating? They're creating a life based on wishes and desires. What did they manifest? The honeymoon. It was heaven on earth, man. Yes. It was, you were healthy, you had energy, you, your life was so beautiful in that honeymoon, you couldn't wait for the next day to get some more of that. And, and, and I said, well, how did that happen? The answer was, no matter how crummy your life was, up until that moment, that's when you were running the program. But the moment you fall in love, it's like taking the red pill. You keep your conscious mind present. There, there's a reason why. <laughs> If everything you were looking for in your life is in front of your face, why would you start thinking? <laughs> everything is right there. You take it all in. So, yeah, the honeymoon part results from you being conscious, staying mindful, keeping your conscious mind present, not defaulting to the subconscious. What's the result? Heaven on earth. And you go, well, yes. how come the honeymoon doesn't last? Because it doesn't last. I say, it doesn't last for a very simple reason. Even if you're in love, you still have to pay the rent, fix the car, and do your chores, whatever it is you've got to do. It means you've got to start thinking again. So how did you create the honeymoon? Two people with only their conscious minds working, wishes and desires, creating from wishes and desires, manifesting heaven on earth. Then I say, what happens? Life gets busy. You start thinking. Oh, yeah, but the moment you start thinking, you start playing those programs in the subconscious. Yeah, but those are the limitations. Those are the sabotage programs. Those are other people's behavior. And all of a sudden, why is that relevant? Because the behavior you downloaded from other people doesn't represent who you are. It represents who they are. You start yes. playing somebody else. That's when, when your partner in your new romance, when you all of a sudden drop into the subconscious, start playing your father's behavior, for example, and your partner sees it. Remember, Bill doesn't see that he's playing his father's behavior, but the other people do. So your partner is seeing you play your father's behavior, which is perhaps in this case negative. Your partner looks at you and goes, who are you? Like, where did that personality come from? And then, of course, the problem is, well, you're the one that didn't even see it. So how do you know? You're just like, you're defending yourself. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I, I, you know, what are you talking about? I've always been the, the good guy, you know? It's like in your conscious mind, yes. 
But the moment you switch to your subconscious, you start playing negative programs. And you didn't see it, but your partner did. That's when the relationship starts to get a little tricky. And the more negative behaviors that come in from both partners, the more compromising you have to do, because that wasn't what you joined up for. You, you signed up for the honeymoon uh, with two people right. living from wishes and desires, and all of a sudden all this other behavior comes in there. It's like, isn't that what I wanted? Compromise, compromise. Well, guess what? The love glow of the honeymoon, the honeymoon experience, sort of goes into history, <laughs> because right. now you're playing more of your behavior from this negative database of subconscious programs. So and the relevance, yeah. The, relevance the honeymoon is, effect. What I love yeah. about the book is that you talk about the power of attitude in changing the blood chemistry of the body. Yeah. And how does one even discover that they have this power to start becoming the architect of their own reality? What are some of the triggers? You've talked of okay. mindfulness. When your beliefs start to take over and run the show, such as a placebo effect, right. you healed yourself not from a drug, you healed it from a belief. And if you start to recognize, oh, my God, I, I changed my life. Or you could be sick as a dog. And your boss calls and says, listen, I need you on the job. And you're there, oh, I'm so sick of a dog or something. And you go, okay, but you got to go to work because it's really important. You go to work and guess what? While you're at work, everything's okay. The moment you come home, it's like, oh, God, sick as a dog. <laughs> but it was what? When you switch your mind to the job you had to do, the power of the mind overrode the illness. When you came back home and you could think about how sick you are, the, the sickness came back. <laughs> you were controlling this the entire time. Uh, hypnosis is also a way of controlling your life because basically the programs that we have in the subconscious came from hypnosis when we were kids anyway. So I could hypnotize you right now, Ralph, and I say, look, here's a glass of water on the table. I want you to pick up this glass of water. And, but I, before you pick it up, I say, but wait, that glass of water weighs 1,000 pounds. And you go over to lift up a glass of water, and guess what? Everyone will watch you try to lift that glass of water, and you're going to sweat, you're going to shake as you try to lift a thousand <laughs> water. And, and you say, how can that be? <laughs> it's just a glass of water. How come you can't lift it? And I say, when the mind believes it's 1,000 pounds, the mind also knows you cannot lift 1,000 pounds. And so what does it do? It creates a situation where you will struggle to lift it, but you won't lift it. I say, how come? And I have it. I say, the muscles that were lifting the glass up, there's also muscles to put the glass down. If I fire both muscles at the same time, does the glass go up or down? The answer is no. It doesn't go anywhere. But your both muscles are working like crazy, and you're sweating and everything. It's like you have created reality out of that. Uh, I'll give you another example. I have so many newspaper articles of uh, women picking up cars off of uh, a, a child underneath the car, especially their own child. And you say, how do a woman lift a car? Weightlifters can't lift a car. And, and I have pictures of a, a guy, actually a couple of weightlifters, muscle bound, sweat coming down, lifting up the car. And here's a woman, no athletic ability at all, lifts up the same car. And the issue is, how can she do that? The answer is, she has no belief that she can't. Her child's under the car. It's like you stop the mother from lifting up the car when her child's under the car. Her belief will lift that car up. And all of a sudden you mean, we are that powerful? I say, yeah, we're all that powerful, except right now, if I say, Ralph, hey, listen, go outside in the driveway, lift up your car. You look me, crazy, I can't lift up a car. I go, that's the belief. Right. You could, uh, you see, uh, 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 and it's real interesting. There's some weird people uh, down in the South that really mess up my mind. These are, these are people who uh, work themselves up into religious ecstasy. Uh, they, they get crazy. They speak in tongues. They play with serpents, stuff like that, you know, like poisonous things like rattlesnakes and stuff like that. Even when they get that, they don't have a problem. But the ones I want to talk to you about are these. They, they call this testifying. Testifying in their terminology means they will demonstrate to you that God takes power over them. God, you know, protects them by doing things that no normal person in their right mind would ever do. And so, and listen to this, they drink strychnine poison mm. and testifying that God protects them. And guess what? No negative consequences. They're not harmed. They drink straight out poison. 
and they don't get harmed. Why? The belief system says that uh, this, this poison, uh, it, God will protect me from this poison. And you think, wow, that's pretty accurate. Well, the same thing as walking across hot coals. Walk across hot coals if you believe in it. But don't walk across hot coals if you don't believe you can do it. <laughs> sure, don't do that. <laughs> and, and so what we're talking about is the power of total belief is totally amazing. But if I assess most anybody in our audience about their beliefs, most of their beliefs are very disempowering and negative and not supporting of who they are because we got programmed that way. And we manifest the program. And so you want to take back your life, you have to go back in and rewrite the programs. Right, right. So belief, changing your belief systems is a great way to start rewriting the programs. You talk of the environment as one of the biggest factors influencing our genes. What other factors would you say are the most important factors? Well, there's a direct environment that we live in, but more importantly is our perception of that environment. As I okay. mentioned earlier, you could live in a healthy environment, but if you believe it's toxic, then you'll get sick. So it wasn't the environment. It was what your perception was. So because you're, you're, that's an interpretation that comes from your mind. So, you know, listen, I, I love hot, spicy Thai food. I mean, I love it so hot that when I eat it, perspiration comes out of my remaining follicles on my head and drips, and I go, wow, this is great, you know? And then I make it, and my neighbor comes over and takes a bite of this stuff and goes, oh, how could you eat this stuff? <laughs> and it's like, point. The environment is the same for both of us. The same Thai food on my spoon is the same as the one on his spoon. I eat it and go, this is totally fabulous. He eats it and is screaming his head off that I'm killing him. And the reality is then, it wasn't the real Thai food that caused the problem. It was the interpretation that the person held. Same, same stimulus, different interpretation. This is the issue of the world in which we live. We're all in the same stimuli. We all have different interpretations. And our world becomes our interpretation. Whatever, as I said, it's not the same as the real world. It's the world that we perceive. And that's why it's so important to change our beliefs first before trying to fix our lives because our beliefs, which are programmed in our subconscious, are running the show 95% of the time. That's what's so frustrating to people because in your conscious mind, you know exactly what you want. I want to be healthy. I want all these things. I know what you want. But the issue is, hey, if it's only operating 5% of the time, then you're not really going to manifest that. You're going right. to manifest the program. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule. But before you go, in your great book, Spontaneous Evolution, you talked about some solutions in healing the planet. Does planet Earth need to be saved or is it just individually we need to save ourselves? Well, planet Earth is always going to be here whether we're here or not. So we have to yes. go with that number one premise. Number two, we have to recognize this. Our belief about how the planet works and how we got here, which is like a Darwinian theory, which is, you know, people, even if you don't go to school, you know Darwinian theory. It's like the dog-eat-dog -dog world. If you, if you don't go out there and fight for your survival, someone's going to walk all over you, and you're going to lose. So we go out there every day in a rat race, you know, that kind of terminology. Like, you've got to struggle. In fact, that's what the definition of Darwinian uh, evolution is, a struggle for survival using a competition in fitness. Those that are more fit get to survive, and those that are less fit die off, and that's why, oh well, yeah, that's how it works. It doesn't. This is not true. But by living this as a belief, we have destroyed ourselves and we're destroying the environment because we haven't recognized that the so-called garden, you know, I use that garden, um, re represents a, a, a world that is not based on competition. A garden is based on cooperation. All the organisms and plants in the garden work together to create the garden. Here we have a garden, you put humans in it, and then the humans say, no, it's all based on competition. So what are we doing? We're competing against each other, we're killing each other, we're trying to disempower each other. Why? I want to be more powerful than you, because if I'm more powerful than you, then I've got a better chance of surviving. And all of a sudden it's not us working together, it's me working for myself. I don't care about you guys, I'm going to do me. 
when we do have a whole world of people doing me and, and being very careless of the harmony and balance of a garden, we end up in a very sad situation, which we are in today. And this is the truth of science. Five times in the history of this planet, life was thriving. I mean, the garden was going beautifully. And five times in history, life got essentially wiped out. And these events were called mass extinctions. Uh, and for example, the dinosaurs were thriving, and then all of a sudden the dinosaurs were gone. <laughs> what happened? Well, they believe in this case, and that mass extinction was due to a comet or asteroid hitting the Earth and upsetting the environment and wiping out life. And so historically, five times in history, uh, the planet has gone through a mass extinction. Unfortunately, and this is a fact of science, today we are in the sixth mass extinction. And this mass extinction is due, science has recognized, to human behavior. The way we live, the way we undermine each other, the way we undermine the environment, the way we go out there and compete is destructive, not just of us, but our behavior is now destroying the environment. And, and so we have to change our behavior in order to survive. We have to recognize that all humans are part of one living superorganism called humanity. Just as a body is made out of 50 trillion cells, I say I'm Bruce. Well, Bruce by full definition means 50 trillion individual cells living in a community. And, and this becomes important because health is when there's harmony in the community, you got a healthy body. When there's disharmony in the community of cells, you have sickness. Well, what we're seeing right now is the recognition that each human, you, me, everybody on this line, is a cell in a bigger organism called humanity. The significance of that is we have to work together to create harmony, otherwise the whole thing's lost. <laughs> we, well, there, there's something in medicine called autoimmune disease. That, in Latin, is equivalent of self-destruction. Humanity as a living superorganism is experiencing what I would call autoimmune disease. We're destroying ourselves by killing each other and messing with each other and destroying the environment, and we're in a bad case of autoimmune disease. To get out of this autoimmune disease, we have to change our belief system. We have to recognize that every one of us is part of the same organism. If you hurt another cell, you're hurting yourself. <laughs> and this is the reality. We have to let go of that Darwinian belief that it's me and I'm against you, which is Darwinian theory, because that has caused the problem. Wow. So why your show is so important, uh, Ralph, and why for, I'm very honored to be on it, is that you are offering the public the new understanding and the new beliefs that are required to create harmony on this planet and harmony within your own biology. Remember, harmony in your biology is health. If you're not healthy, only 1% of that can I attribute to genes. 99% of unhealthy individuals, it's because of the way they're living on the planet, their belief system, their lifestyle. And why is this important? Because these are things we can change. It genes you can't change. But the way you live, you can change. The way you believe, you can change. So the evolution that we're facing is an evolution that says, stop killing each other. <laughs> stop antagonizing each other. Start learning to live in harmony with each other. As we work together in harmony, we work together and create community. The healthy community reflects a healthy organism. And, and so whether it's the community of cells in your body, which reflect your health, and remember, again, it's so important, because when we have something that, you know, a health issue, we go, oh, my body is broken, my body is stupid, my body made mistakes, and I go, no, 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 you're living in a lifestyle that doesn't support the health of the cells. And this becomes relevant because you're the one that changes, if you change the lifestyle, then you change your health. <laughs> And so we have power to do that, but then we've been programmed to believe, no, you're a victim. Yeah, you're a victim of your genetics and your biology, and you can't do anything. It's like totally untrue. But in a world based on belief, if that's what you believe, then you become the victim. And we really have to change our whole insight and our whole understanding of victimization because it's just a self-belief system that is self-destructive. And, and that we are, by necessity, 
creating a new world. And it's very important because the young people in this world, which I call the millennial generation, people 40 years old and younger, represent the new civilization. And it's really interesting because most of them are thinking, oh my God, life sucks. I can't even, you know, I'm living at home with my parents and I'm almost 40. You know, it's like, oh my God, I can't get a job. I can't get started. And I go, well, here's why it's important. If I went out to a conventional millennial generation person, I say, hey, listen, the stock market's going to crash. They would look at me and go, what's a stock? I like, I own a stock. Like, I own no stock. What the hell do I care if the stock market crashes? And I go, this is why the evolution is going to happen. 50% or more of the people, which are under now 40, do not have a hold on the existing structure. And that means that the existing structure is getting weak and about to fall down. Because it doesn't work. That's why we have all the problems. We have to change completely. The Internet is the evolution of the global nervous system. The Internet allows you and me to talk in different places while at the same time allowing this message to go out to millions of other people simultaneously. The Internet is a nervous system that connects 7 billion humans, which are cells, 7 billion cells, into one organism. The Internet is the brain that is working through the cooperative effort of 7 billion people. And so we are now facing a new belief system New information is coming across. The population has a chance to decide what it wants. The significance is the millennial generation doesn't give a damn about the existing structure. It doesn't work for them anyway. And so they don't support it. And I say, well, yeah, when more than half the people don't support the existing structure, it falls down. And so we're in a state of the system falling apart. And a lot of people are afraid. Oh, my God, oh, it's falling apart. And I go, no, 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 you don't get it, man. <laughs> this system is killing us. This system is what's bringing about the sixth mass extinction of life. We, if we don't change the system, we are definitely doomed. That's a fact. And it's not 100 or a million years from now. It's in decades this whole thing's going to fall apart. And so the relevance is this. When you see it falling apart, honor that for this reason. Whatever falls apart can be rebuilt and replaced with something better. And that's what we're doing right now. Government's falling apart, business is falling apart, health is falling apart. All of these things, I go, yeah, great. They're not working for us now. So uh, the option is now to build something better. Your program now is part of building something better. And that's why, again, it's important to give knowledge to people, because it's a simple fact, and people have heard it all their lives, knowledge is power. Yes. What they don't get, and this is the one that, the, the secret part, because this is what kills you, a lack of knowledge is a lack of power. We have been deprived of the new knowledge that empowers us. <laughs> so when we get the new knowledge, we become more empowered. We get to take over the control of our lives. We get to create that honeymoon effect. If 7 billion people were living the honeymoon effect, the earth wouldn't look like heaven. The earth would be heaven. Yes. And I think that's the big joke. I tell you the truth. That, you know, I, I know I'm going on here, but I want to close with this because it's a joke. The joke is this. Oh, if you live well when you die, you can go to heaven. And I want to suggest something totally different. <laughs> You were born into heaven. Mm -hmm. This is what you come to create. This is where you come to experience. When you're dead, you leave with the memories of it. But you no longer have the abilities, physical, to create life. And this becomes important because why are we here? To create the honeymoon effect. To create heaven on earth. Only our programming has taken that away. Wow. New programming. I'd rather see the heaven on earth because if you were living your heaven on earth and I'm living my heaven on earth, I know that would just enhance everybody's life because each person who's living heaven on earth is creating heaven on earth. This is heaven. And I just want to say thank you so much because your work has changed my life forever and millions of people out there. You're doing something which I don't even think you comprehend what you're doing. It's just phenomenal work really creating that ripple effect which is changing the course of humanity for the better it's so inspiring reading every one of your books
just leaves me in awe. But once again, please give out your website to the audience so they can find your latest work. Yes, it's so simple. It's brucelipton.com. So easy and lots of material freely downloadable to, you know, to tell the story that we've been talking about in an abbreviated form. On the web, you can get a bigger, a bigger story coverage. Well, thank you once again, Dr. Bruce. And thank you to everyone out there. We are here, infinite waters, diving deep once again. Stay well, stay healthy. Peace.